Hello everyone, and again, thanks for attending on the first Island webinar, How to Use the Talking Lab Quest. My name is Nicholas Nybert from the Independent Science Marketing Team, and I will be co-hosting this meeting. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat window, or there will be time at the end for verbal questions. Now today I have the pleasure of introducing Asha Nybert, our Lead Curriculum Development Specialist at Independent Science, to tell you more about how you can make accessible STEM fun and easy. Ashley? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today and for your interest in making science more fun and accessible for yourselves or students or clients today. So for those of you not familiar with the Talking Lab Quest, I'm going to give a brief overview of what the device looks like. Then we're going to go over the keystrokes and then we're going to show some different interactive activities with different sensors that you can use that might be relevant within your field. Now note this is only a sampling. There's only 75 different sensors that will interface with the LabQuest. So we only have time for a few brief samples today. But if anyone has any questions about it, you can feel free to write it in the chat or you can wait until the end for questions. So I'm holding up now for those that can see it, Talking Lab Quest. So it is a box that is about four inches long by one inch high by three inches wide. And so the orientation of it is when you hold it on the desk, it will have three physical buttons to your right. And those buttons are a collection button, a home button, and a back button. So when you have it in the orientation with those physical buttons to your right, then what's going to be on the left is a power button. Then we have a space with a little flap for digital sensors, which we'll talk about. And then we have a space for microphone and headphone ports. So if you prefer to have it personally or you prefer to broadcast out to a classroom, you can do that. This is also good for if you have any students or you are a student with hearing loss. Then um, we have on the left hand side of the device, we have three analog ports that you can plug in sensors to, as well as a USB drive slot in order to plug the keyboard for. It is touch screen enabled, as well as keyboard driven, so that you can choose whatever you'd like to and your students or yourself can use whichever interface works best for you. So when you turn it on, it will announce hello. Welcome to Talking Lab Quest. Please wait. So this is what the screen looks like when you turn it on. I'm going to turn on the high contrast mode using F11 so that it's easier for everybody to see. So this is something that is specific to the Lab Quest. And so it has a black background with yellow lettering on it. The typical one has a white background with black lettering, and there is the F11 key can be used to toggle that on and off easily. So if you prefer to look at it in one way on one page and another way on another, then it's easy to, to do with that. So first we're going to go into the LabQuest application. LabQuest application, sensor page. And so the first thing Zero, on here is the sensor one, page. page. Run, and I have hooked up right now one of our digital sensors. This is a motion detection sensor. So it's a little box that has like a little speaker to it. It makes a ticking noise, a lot like a dolphin emitting a sonar. And so it will check out how far things are so you can use it to figure out things like how far the area you have around you is, like how tall is your roof. Uh, I use them a lot to put on 
a table if I am going to be doing any kind of sales pitch so that I know when it goes within underneath one meter that somebody's standing in front of me. So it's great for if you do any kind of BEP sort of thing as well as, or Randolph Shepard, or as well as if you do any kind of thing where you have a blind person staffing a table and you don't want to look ridiculous with saying hello every time you hear movement. So, and then as well, you may use this in physics laboratory with the frictionless cars. So we're going to use this to demonstrate real quick. So it will read out. First off, we're going to go through quickly. Our F1 and F2 buttons will make it softer or louder. And then F3 button will start and stop our recording. F5 and F6 will make it slower or faster. Slower. Faster. And we have optimized this, I believe, in order to do well for the showing. But if anyone has any issues with the speed or the volume, please feel free to type into the chat screen and my co-host will let me know to change that. So right now, we have our our talking lab quest section. I'm going to start a new file so that I can open it up. And then So on our original page, it should read off when it comes up. Makes that noise so that you know when it's turning on and off. So when we have a sensor attached, it will read out different selections on our, our talking lab quest. So I'm going to hook up another sensor real quick so that we have a new one to work with. So this real quick is called a go direct sensor. So we're going to jump to that. It has a flashing light on it. So if you're a blind user, you'll press it and hold it for approximately two seconds and that will turn it on. There's some numbers on the back that you need to know in advance. If you're the only one who's using it, then it's easy. But once you have a classroom set, you need to make sure you know the proper numbers on here. In our case, ours is 0F105446, because if you don't have the right numbers with yours, then it's possible that your student might collect the wrong data. Now, this can be avoided by using a wired sensor, but if you want the convenience of having a sensor that doesn't have any wires, it's what you do. And so, how we get there is we hit F10 to go into our menus. And then, so I'm going to power this off real quick and then we'll show you an intro for how it turns on, the noise it makes and everything like that. So when it first turns on, if you have any residual vision, it has some kind of little graph picture on it or if you have a teacher, does so when you first turn it on, you need to wait approximately 40 seconds or so before you hear it turn on. So we'll wait for that to start up. And there is a standby mode that you can put it into as well, so you don't have to wait for a complete shutdown every time. Sorry, boys, talking Land Quest version 2, talking Land Quest application. Please wait. So that's the intro screen, and from that, it takes approximately 30 to 45 seconds for it to load. Quest application. Sensor page. Data collection. So here is our sensor page, and we're going to pair this Go Direct sensor. So I'm going to hit the F10 Menu. button Menu. in Menu. order to go to our sensor setup. Um, now, if you have an analog sensor, it will automatically pair. Menu, sensor. Menu, so when we go, 
we go down to the wireless device setup and then we're going to hit the right arrow to hit go direct and it will wait a while to initiate the Bluetooth services. So it might be up to 30 seconds or so to wait for that because these run on a Bluetooth setting. So let's see. West application, sensor page, device box data collection, menu, file, menu, yeah, sensor, jumped. menu, wireless device setup, go left, setup, push button, cancel, GDS, TMP, zero, right. 105,446. So you hear it read GDX TMP 0F10546. So since that's the only sensor around, we know that this is the one that we're using. But again, if you have a classroom set, you're going to want to make sure that every student has their proper collection set up for that and knows the right number. So a good way to do that is to put braille dymo tape or large print tape on the back that reads off the proper number. So we're going to hit enter to select Push them. Okay. And then we tab over twice to hit okay. And then it will initialize the sensor. Left west application, sensor page, GDS, temperature 24.4 degrees Celsius. So that's our current readout. GDS. And it will read that off every two and a half seconds. So I'm going to put press F3 in order to collect data. And then I'm going to rub my hands together in order to get our temperature to go up. Collection ended. And then we hit the F12 button three. in when order to go to the next button. page. And so it's created on this page a nice graph. Um, and so the graph on here is automatically generated. It has statistics so we can tab over. And then we, if we hit it, enter on where it says plot one details box, then it will tell you the statistics that it recorded. So we took 43 samples. Our standard deviation was 1.3567. Mean 25.2. Our maximum was 27.3 degrees Celsius at 20, 21 seconds. And the minimum temperature it read was 23.7 at 2 seconds. And so the automatic setting with all of these is the Celsius temperature, but you can also change it over to Kelvin or Fahrenheit, depending on your preference. Sample. Push button. Okay. So now, I said about that handy graph that we have. Now, that graph is great and all if you are a sighted individual or if you have low vision and you can see the graph on the page. Now, if you are totally blind or if you just prefer an audio learning method, then it's a lot easier to have what we call an audio graph sonification. So in order to initialize that, and a, we're going to hit F10, and then go over to Sonify, and then hit Start Sonification with Enter key, and it'll have temperature run one. Now before I initialize this, I'm going to say that what it's going to do in order to give us an audio idea of the graph is that we're going to have a lower pitch for when there is a lower number and we're going to have a higher pitch for a higher number. So it will play off a tone in order to correlate with the data points that will give you an idea of the shape of the curve that you made. 
as well as it will play a little tick noise every quarter of the graph so that you have an idea of where you are in the graph at that time. So if you're looking for something like when it suddenly dropped in temperature, then it would be great for listening for that. And you could tell around what point in the graph it is. So we're going to go through that. So we can hear we have a nice increasing curve there that went straight up and that matches with our data that we were talking about. But say I want to know what happened at a certain point in our graph. So I hit F12 and then I can learn more about a specific section in our run. So if I want to know what the specific temperature was at three and a half seconds, then I can go through. And I'm just doing this by hitting the down arrow key on my keyboard. And then we hear that at 3.5 seconds, it was 23.7 degrees. And so for anyone that's interested, that looks like this. And then again, we can turn on and off the high contrast mode for that. Some students find it to be easier without the high contrast mode on the table page because the table page will have a gray and white section in order to help you differentiate what line you're on, whereas the high contrast just has the list of yellow lines. Lab instructions page. So this is a laboratory instructions page. We have several different handy scientific resources on the here. You can also access the scientific resources on the independent science website. Those are all free for you to use. So these are resources like lists of scientists with disabilities that are hard to come across and descriptions of birthstones, constellations, your amino acids list, any number of things and are difficult for blind students to come across. Those are available free on the website and then as well with the purchase on the LabQuest, all of the Vernier laboratory manuals, which are compatible with the NGSS system, that all is uploaded automatically onto the file in the LabQuest so that you can pull one up, look at your laboratory, and be able to run through those. Then we have a notes page, which is basically like a sample journal. I wouldn't personally suggest doing your entire laboratory report on here, but you could. I more so use it for if you have a short note to write. So for example, if I spilled three milligrams on sample three, then I can write L L E B three M G S B L and then I can have it repeat back to me and then it displays it on the screen as well. Now all of this can be uploaded so if I go to the file page I can select PDF, print to PDF and then I can send it to a flash drive and then we can either share the data with the teacher, which will have a collection of all of the data as well as the graph analysis on here, or we can also take that file and plug it in, interface it with a tiger embosser in order to make a tactile version of that graph, which is great for students so that you can get an analysis of what that kind of curve actually looks like. So now we are going to go into some of the different sensors that we have available 
And actually, we'll go first and look at some of the features. So on board, we have a basic scientific calculator. And so I can use my different keys on the keyboard and just type out two plus two, two, two and then get that that equals four. I can also go in and do sign functions and then the additional scientific calculator functions that I might need. The F4 key is sort of a forwards back key. So it will take me back to the home page when I hit F4 because that was the last page I was on. F5 and F6 will tell you um, what speed you're, you're speaking at. F, for F7, if we click we that, we get a lovely talk about the battery, which is great because I hate it when I'm doing an experiment and suddenly something just dies on you. You don't want all kinds of time wasted for that. So you can always hit F7 and figure out something about the battery status. And then say I want to know the current time, we can hit F8 for that. And if I had it set up correctly, then it would read it out. Um, and then, so then the F12 key is going to be our forwards key in the equivalent of our tab between pages key in our lab, our lab quest app. And the F11 is our shortcut key for turning on and off high contrast. So now I'm going to show you the periodic table. So we have on here the periodic table of elements. And if I prefer to use the stylus that's included with it, I can poke on an element and it will make it larger for me to see it. So if I want to hold it like this, then I can up by my eye. And the periodic table is optimized for a high contrast view. And then once you click onto that, it has all of the information you might want to know about any particular element. So a lot of times it's difficult to get access to a periodic table that's accessible. We have that here on the screen. There's also a free resource on our website under the student corner where you can find an accessible periodic table that you can feel free to use with your students or anyone that you want to show it to that will work with your table commands in your screen reader. And so that's free to use for anybody who, who would like that option. So if you have students that are looking for different symbols on the periodic table and atomic numbers, we'll have that. And in the future, we will be updating that as well to have more options. So on the LabQuest periodic table, once we click onto it, we get all these notes about the periodic table so we can hear a few of them. Symbol, CL, atomic number, 17. Atomic weight, U, 35.453. Density grams per cubic centimeter, 0 0.00317. Melting point Kelvin, 172.2. So this will have a ton of different things, including your SPDF notation, which is great for chemists and figuring out all kinds of things that you never would have had access to before, as well as at the bottom, they have a description of a physical description of what it looks like, what the element looks like, as well as we have on there uh, when it was discovered and by whom, if, it, if the data is known for that. So now I'm going to take some time to do uh, a display of some of the other lesser known sensors. One of the sensors that we have that goes really well with our biology section is this is a hand grip heart rate monitor. So what we're going to do with this one is this is one of our more unique sensors in that it comes with a little dongle switch. 
So we are going to plug in the dongle into our port on the side and the dongle can work for up to a meter away, but you need to make sure that there's no electronics in between it. So we're making sure that our keyboard currently is behind our lab quest and the dongle is out front. So then I'm going to hit enter on the lab quest lab. So now because I had recorded previous data, it will ask me the following. It will ask me, so it will ask me if I wanted to, um, if I want to discard my previous data or not. So in this case, I wish to discard my data, but I can also choose to save it. This is a wonderful kind of dummy feature because when I'm exhausted at the end of a long day at a laboratory, I'm probably going to forget and accidentally dump all of my data. So this reminds me to save it in a file. But in this case, we want to discard it. So we're going to select that. And so I'm going to turn off this go direct temperature. And to turn off the go direct sensor, you just press and hold for approximately 10 seconds and it will turn off. If you forget to turn it off, it will turn off eventually as well. So now we have the, the blood pressure monitor. Now what's special about this one is that most of our sensors automatically have a readout. However, the blood pressure monitor needs, it needs to have an analysis of your heart rate first for about 14 seconds. And so it will only turn on our Bluetooth enabled section once you have both hands on the heart rate sensor and once you have hit the record button. So it seems seemingly like nothing's going to happen for a few seconds, but then it will start reading it. So that's an important thing to note in case you don't want your students to think it's not working. So I'm gonna hit record on that. And that's where the, the physical record button comes in handy. And so now I'm holding our sensors with my palms on the metal part. And so once it has a successful reading on that, then it should start letting me know my um, information. Menu, file. And if you let go of it, it causes issues. So I accidentally just let go of that. This one is one of the harder ones to use as an individual because you have to hold both of these sensors at the same time. So what's happening right now on the screen is it should be reading it out but I can't hit the mode, the buttons for the readout right now. So you have one student that holds this and one student that would listen to the readouts. And so it will read off about 81 beats per minute at this point in time. And then it will collect a change with that. So we're going to stop that recording. And then as well, one of the other things you have is if anybody has any English as a second language or additional language students, the lab press can also, we, for just $100 more, you can purchase additional packages for, um, for French, Spanish, German, Portuguese, and Italian. So six languages, including English, and we're working towards getting other languages as well. So while that is loading, I'm going to plug in and start telling you about one of our next sensors that's for biology and environmental sciences as well. So, this is a flow rate sensor. Um, for anyone who can't see it, it has several PVC pipes that are really long about, eh, you could probably stretch it about a meter, a meter and a half, there's additional ones. And so this will protect it from any water. At the top, well, 
the bottom when you're holding the sensor. There's like a little windmill sort of looking thing that is good for measuring our flow, right? For any kind of rivers or um, I had some students that built some dams and they wanted to see how fast the flow was in front of and behind their dam. So that is another thing that you can do with that. Let's see here. Now this one's deciding to go. So. so we'll do a demonstration with this now. Switch it over to my other one. CH1, flow rate 0 0 0 0 0.06 meters per second. So I have got here. Flow rate 0 0 0 0 0.04 meters per second. We've got just a kitchen bowl, a towel, and a glass of water that we're going to demonstrate with. So I'm going to put out my towel over the bowl. And so now if I hold the little thin shape perpendicular to myself and then pour water over it. So the fastest I could get it to go was 0 0.041 meters per second. But if we have a river, of course, that's going to go a lot faster, as well as with a hose and such like that. So that's a good way to do experiments with that. Um, and then another sensor that we have is our photo gate sensor. So it looks sort of like a little Y shape. And in the middle of the top of the Y is going to be like a little laser section, not a laser. It will just go over and you could touch it just fine. <laughs> So then this, this one is one for, in order to keep with our time, I'm going to just show we have that. And we can use things like spring constants if we throw a spring through it, like the slinky we've got, then we can do that. And this one would need what's called a go link because it has a different type of interface than the lab quest itself would accept. But once you put the go link with that, then the lab quest will accept that as well. Then this is a go direct accelerometer. So we can hook that up real quick. Lab quest application, sensor page. And so again, we're going to do that go direct readout where we hit F10. Menu, file. Menu and then right menu, arrow menu, to menu, sensors. Sensor. And then down to wireless device setup and then hit go direct. And on this one, our numbers are going to be 072013L. So we'll see how that one's different than the last one. So we're going to tab down, select that, and hit OK. So with this EDS, one, force minus it EDS, will measure force positive minus and negative force newtons. Force and the way that it does negative is if you're pushing in on it, EDS, it will read it as negative. And if you're pulling out on it, it will read it as positive newtons. So again, EDS, if I take my spring and hook it up to it, we can use it for physics and learning EDS, force on these springs. Force 1.23 newtons. And we can see GDS, that my spring, when I push GDS, it up to the top, it holds negative 0.47 newtons. And then when I drop it down, we get to 1.08 newtons at the fastest time. So, 
So with that, I think um, we can open up for some questions and comments. Uh, Ethan Warren has raised his hand. Okay. Additionally, JC Provost has raised their hand. All right, so Ethan, you are up first. So you are off mute right now. What is okay. your question? Okay, so I believe the GoDirect temperature survey it measures ambient air temperature, correct? Yes, so okay. first yeah. starts off, it will read off um, the temperature in your room. Yeah. And okay. then you can stick it in any kind of liquid that you yeah. have. Is it? Like it has a probe attached. It has a probe. Yes. So is it like a standard thermometer type probe? Yeah. So when you glass, glass or plastic? Hmm. Glass or plastic? It's metal. Are there any glass versions? So we don't currently have a glass version. There is. Um, if you're wondering for um, a higher temperature selection, we do have a high, a large. Okay temperature probe as well. What I'm thinking of is suppose you have a standard reflux setup with say a 250 milliliter RBF and a standard Allen adapter and it's a two neck flask say and then you have a <laughs> thermometer adapter attached to the second neck. Would this type of probe be compatible with the standard organic glass thermometer pocket or adapter? I believe so. Okay. Um, one of the things that we can do with that in order to work better with that is I can look into that. And if you'd like um, to contact me and I, and send an email to a Nybert, that's A-N-E-Y-B-E-R-T at independent science spelled I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-C-E-S-C-I-E-N-C-E dot C-O-M, then I can look further into that for you in order to get your specific question. And anybody that's on this call can feel free to send emails with questions as well. Okay, great. Thank you, Ethan. And so now I believe JC Provost was our next. Correct. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I was wondering, um, could this be used in an oscilloscope context, uh, given the proper sensors, of course? So what exactly are you hoping to? Well, okay, let me put my question a bit differently then. Um, could we have two sensors in parallel reacting to yes. two different things, hence constructing a graph with those um, independent results, so to speak. Yes, we can. And um, that is, thank you for bringing that up. So I was just demonstrating them serially, but you can have them in parallel as well. If you are a totally blind user, then the number of sensors you can add to it, I would say I would not put past five. Because once you hit in five, parallel, starts, that is right in parallel. Once you hit five, oh, okay. it starts slowing down the interface. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, if you want to see the display on the screen, or you want somebody to see the display on the screen, then I would suggest no more than three at a time. One of the advantages of being blind there. <laughs> so, um, because the display page will get smaller and smaller, so it will be difficult for them to read it if somebody is trying to visually read it. Yeah, yeah, but for and us, it won't make a difference. Yeah, it won't make a difference if you're just listening to it from an audio perspective. So, so then we will be able to read uh, each of the sensors, even if they're in, in parallel, we would be able to read them independently or uh, through sonification, I gather, uh, read the yes. actual so, graph or two, two of them or whatever. So um, the sonification can only do one of the sensors at a time, but say I am measuring acceleration and position at the same time, 
then I can choose whether I want to hear my acceleration graph in the sonification or the position graph, and I can play those after one another in order to be able to identify specific access points that I can And so you would be able to do that from, say, within the same the time span. So you can't play the acceleration and the position at the same time. You'd have to play the sonification serially right now. But um, that's in order to help ensure that you can hear those track points with the little ticks more easily. Yeah, no, I guess what I was trying to say was if you sample, say, uh, for, I don't know, say three seconds, and mm -hmm. then you want to read one sensor. I understand that it can't be sonified concurrently, that you have to mm -hmm. switch, and that's fine. But then within that, w when I said time span, I meant, say, you sample for three seconds. So you look at sensor A, then you sonify it, then you switch to sensor, uh, sensor B and sonify it, but still within that uh, you know, sampled three seconds. Is that possible? Yes, yes. So okay. when you hit the collect button, it will collect f data for every every single sensor that you have plugged in at that moment. And so, so then you you seconds. play with that buffer. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you, JC. All right. Well, um, we have about. 10 minutes left. So I can just discuss some of the other features that we have with our lab quest more in depth. So I'm going to go into the application and then hit uh, F12 and then go over to our file page and I'll demonstrate some of our files in our laboratory instructions view. Menu, I, menu, I new. So we go menu, over to menu, view, menu, I, new instructions. and we view our laboratory Open instructions. Land instructions. So these are all things that we have on loaded on the screen. You can hear how many different things there are. So these are all entire lab manuals. Folder, advanced chemistry with further. Folder, biology with further. Neo2, folder, chemistry with further. Neo2, folder, earth science with further. Neo2, folder, elementary science with further. Neo2, folder, forensics with further. Neo2, folder, human physiology with further. Neo2, folder, investigating environmental science with inquiry. Neo2, slash folder, middle school science with further. Folder, nuclear radiation with further. Neo2 folder, physical science with further. Neo2 folder, physics with further. Folder, science resources. Neo2 and so Neo5 the science resources physics. is something that is only available on the Talking Lab Quest or on our website. So you can click onto that. And I then and the complete list of scientists with disabilities and their contributions of HTML. We Neo2 can go through, five, these are all. Um, requested files. So we are currently working on next updates. So if anybody has a file in mind that you would really like to see, then you can always send us a request to any of our team members and just say request for scientific resources. We'd be happy to help you out with that as well as any requests for future webinars that you'd like to work with. If you're interested in any specific science, we can go with that as well once we um, get some requests. So feel free to email us again for that. Uh, and then we're gonna go through some of these science resources. Kyle, birth some list with descriptions, not Kyle. Chemical changes, BS digital changes, not HTML. Neo2, Kyle. Famous constellations and their descriptions, not HTML. So Neo2 this is. Slash Neo5 slash this is my favorite one. So we're going to go into famous constellations and their descriptions where we can hear about um, different stars and what constellations look like, because that's something I hadn't really had too much experience with prior, with Land seeing lists of that. Land instructions page. 
So it shows on the page the print as well for anyone who's interested in that. And then we can go down. We want supposedly a tense of cut bearer to the dots when the eternal youth for his service. Its strivers stars are elder and be that one like which hunts particularly right, and so this constellation is often hard to spot. Though popular in the sun age of Ashwabius, I I mentioned in the 1960s, the real age of Ashwabius won't occur until the year 2597, as an astrological age begins when the sun is in a particular constellation during the fertile Ashwabius. Ashwabius meeting, people have seen notes page. So and we have several more um, on there, but we are running low on time. So I want to ask again, is there final questions from any of the audience? Looks like Ethan Warren and JC Provost both have another question. All right. So I believe Ethan was get, up first. All right, let's get Ethan then. All right, go ahead, Ethan. Okay, so um, two part question. One, does this thing have a pH meter available? Yes, absolutely. Um, the probe is metal again? Um, so that one is a uh, protected plastic with a glass bulb on the bottom. Okay, what type of plastic? I do not know that off the top of my head. PPE or, or uh, would it be polypropylene or PTFE? I don't know off the top of my head and I don't like I'm, tr I'm trying to information. Like what, what acids would it, like, at what point could you just simply not use it anymore? Um, for that, you would be able to find more specific descriptions on the product page. Mm -hmm. more so if you go in that, details. it will tell you all of the different um, maximums and minimums that okay. can work with. Like, I mean, for example, can it handle like oxidizing agents? Like, I mean, like, could it handle an actual... Like, like, I definitely would not put it with something like a piranha solution. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, that's like a strong oxidizer and a dehydrating agent and a strong acid. So, yeah. Yeah. Or like, or like, you know, hardcore nitrating solution. Or that is possible. Again, I'd look on um, the page for specifics. Oleum. I specifically tested the max and mins for that. Okay. Great. I'll check them. And what was the other part of your question? Um, the first part was like, is there a meter? And the second part was- Oh, okay. Have a better Great, thanks. All right, awesome. Thank you, Ethan. JC, let's see if I can unmute you this time. I think I've got it. JC? Yes, one, two, can you hear me? Yes, I can, go ahead. All right, um, yeah, uh, so uh, that's a simple question. Uh, the speech parameters, uh, can mm -hmm. we modify them? like pitch and rate and stuff? Yes, you can modify the pitch, um, the pitch and the speaking rate. So the speaking rate has hot keys for F5 and F6 on a keyboard. And I should mention the keyboard is a simply a USB keyboard. The one I have is a glowing keyboard that can is helpful for more low vision. Oh yeah but you can plug in whatever your favorite USB keyboard is with that. So okay. if there's any users on here that prefer the ones that are like the large yellow and black high contrast ones that works as well. Um, so feel free to pair your favorite keyboard with it. All right, thank you. Thank you, JC. And so we are about out of time today. So I want to thank you all for coming to our webinar. And again, if anybody wishes to contact me afterwards, my name is Ashley Nybert and you can email at A-N-E-Y, B as in boy, E-R-T at I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-C-E S-C-I-E-N-C-E dot com. Or you can also go to our main page and be able to type in just any of our product sales people will be happy to work with you. And then if you prefer to 
talk on the phone, we're also happy to do that. And our number is 866-862-9665 for anybody that wants to call. And I am extension five if you'd like to reach me, but any of our sales associates would be happy to help. And everybody has different specialties as well with that. Um, most of our employees are blind and low vision scientists ourselves. So we can have a match for somebody with you and your field with that. Well, thank you all for coming today and hopefully we will get to see you on our Logger Pro talk again at the same time tomorrow. And if not, this is going to go on the YouTube channel our YouTube channel if you are unable to make that as well. Thank you for coming today.